Hey everyone, thanks for joining. Um, you know, today we'll be talking about uh, you know working with index lifecycle management. Um, I think um, it's funny. Um, Josh and I had, had planned this meetup uh, some time ago, <clears throat> and kind of going through and and helping out. Um, you know, both from our experience in working with ILM and and you know help. You know, hopefully by the end of this, you'll have a good idea of. Uh, how to use it, how to test with it, um, very simple. Uh, um, and also uh, some of the 7.10 announcements have, have come out, um, it was just released on November 10th. So we'll kind of go through some of that. And well, um, you know, if this is, uh, the intention of, of this would be very from a high level. And if you wanna get more into the weeds and more in, into the depth, I think we'll be doing that as a, as a part of, of a part two. So definitely look forward to that. Um, so before we get started here, um, I just wanted to remind everyone, you know, uh, we have a code of conduct. Um, you know, Elastic Community is made up of May walks of life. So for whatever reason, um, you know, if there's an issue or anything that comes up, um, you know, or if you have any questions with that, you know, definitely reach out to us uh, directly through the webinar, um, or you can go to this um, Elastic uh, Community Code of Conduct and you know, get some more information about, uh, about that. So we just wanna make sure we're, we're ex respectful for uh, all the walks of life here in the meeting. And again, this is, uh, the, the intention of this meetup is as if we were at a meetup. So it's very conversational, very laid back. There's not a lot of um, uh, streamers and fireworks and, and production value. Uh, but what it's really meant to do is, is really you know, give you some engineering information, some, some information about ILM and how you can use that in your environment, um, maybe answer some questions that you have. So again, if, if you do have any questions or anything else, uh, you could definitely, um, um, as you know, myself or Josh are, are presenting, I'll keep to, I'll, I'll monitor the chat to make sure things are, uh, you know, there's questions coming along. And at the end, uh, during the Q&A, yeah, you can definitely speak and, and um, you know, give us feedback or uh, give us uh, any questions that you might have. Uh, one last thing that I kind of, before I go into the presentation here is talking about this Elastic Contributor Program. So uh, let's see here, it's been a few months since we've announced the program. And if you don't know about it, uh, I would definitely go check it out. If it's, if you, uh, uh, the Contributor Program essentially is Kind of giving back to a lot of the folks that contribute toward the Elastic community, and it gives the ability for you to contribute code, write blogs, produce videos. Um, there's a list of uh, contributions that I'll show a little later. Um, in kind of a gamification type process, um, and one of the things about this contributor program is is really you know as you uh, create content and 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 distribute it across your community or your local community, or you know, across the your regional community, you know, we wanted to uh, award you points, and and at the end of the of an annual cycle, we kind of calculate those points based off of how many you have, and and award swag or different prizes. And um, you know, it's just a high level list of the prizes here for for that contributor program, um, giving out swag, knowledge, um, extended trials, um, you know, virtual badges, um, and there's a lot of things that we want to you know you know provide back to you as being a contributor. Um, you know, look, some of these um, contribution types, for example, would be, um, you know, presentations, written content, tutorials, translations, code contributions, or even validating, um, you know, if something, so if someone's written something that it's, you know, it's, it's, it's valid. So definitely um, the eligibility is, you know, any contributions between February 1st through January uh, 31st of 2021, uh, you can go ahead and contribute and start uh, ordering points for that. So I think that's very cool. There's no obviously obligation to join. It's just it's a cool thing to, if you're already contributing within the community, uh, might as well get tracked for it. So, well, perfect. Um, so yeah, uh, Josh and I are your speakers today. Uh, Josh, do you wanna introduce yourself? Yep, hello, my name is Josh Spear, as you can see there, that's a uh, picture of me from when I first started Elastic a little over a year ago. Uh, prior to that, I was um, a customer. So I have some, some working knowledge and some empathy with, uh, with our customers being able to work through some of the issues that I have uh, dealt with in the past, including ILM, which is why I, it was kind of near and dear to my heart because I have um, had, had to work through implementation or had struggles with it. So I thought that uh, trying to show people how to, how to get from here to there makes it might make it a little bit easier for them. 
So, but happy to be here. Awesome. And I know, uh, Faith, um, my, my apologies, you don't have your name or, or picture here, but would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Faith Westorp. I'm on Elastic's community team, and um, I help run um, our user groups. So if you get any emails through the um, from the Amer Virtual User Group, if that's how you found out about this event, those emails come from me. And um, I also help run our YouTube channel and the contributor program. So if you have any questions about those, um, or if you want to speak at a meetup in the future, please let me know in chat and um, welcome. And thank you. Big thank you to Josh and George, my wonderful colleagues for speaking today. Super excited to, to dive in. Thanks, Faith. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, and then my name is George Kobar and um, just a person that's lucky enough to, to be here at Elastic. And um, I've been with Elastic for about three and a half years or so. Um, and it's funny, I started in support just like the Josh and moved um, to you know different teams within Elastic. So I'm very happy to uh, be presenting to everyone here as well. Um, now, if you're new to Elastic, I, I did want to take just a quick two minutes to talk about what it, Elastic is, you know, bear with me, you know, if you have your headset on, maybe you can go get something to drink if you already know Elastic. But if you're new to Elastic, I think it's really important to really talk about um, why we are a search company. Um, what I'm going to do is I have this kind of video that uh, I like to share with it. And um, that way it keeps me on time. I don't talk too much about the company. Uh, that way, you know, we can kind of get past and, and moving to the uh, content here. Uh, so let me go ahead and load that up here. So let's do, let's see here. Um, I'll just share the screen here. That'll be a little easier. Perfect. So when we think about uh, search, we kind of think about um, the common use uses for search, uh, like a web browser or, um, you know, looking through Chrome or uh, Firefox or, you know, whatever web browser you are. And essentially what you're doing is you're just looking through, uh, you know, a, a box, typing a query, and hopefully you're getting results. And out of the, the billions of, of results or possible things that are out there on, on the web today, uh, hopefully you're getting uh, a, a result that's not only relevant, but was within an amount of time that's acceptable to you, right? So you're kind of looking for what's the top 10 searches of this, or if that doesn't really uh, work, how do I go through the next uh, group of searches? Or maybe how can I refine my query and so forth? But uh, search is a lot more than just um, a box or search box. It's also a visualization. You know, so we talk about use cases like uh, observability or, um, you know, enterprise search, you know, being able to, to visualize this data, like uh, through bar graphs, pie charts, looking through the many different logs, uh, metrics, and traces um, that happen to be with the environment is extremely important. And having those visualizations really help out. I'm um, narrowing with sliders is also search. So if maybe you're on an e-commerce page and you want to reduce by price, that's very important. That's also a search component. And then also filtering is search. Let's say if I'm looking for a restaurant uh, that delivers, uh, that's uh, let's say um, either a Chinese uh, restaurant or Mexican restaurant, and maybe only takes credit cards. You know, filtering is also search. That's a, a, a big thing that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, or, you know, when we maybe want to go out to eat um, or pick up, I guess, you know, considering these days. But mapping is also search. So we think about um, if we needed to have a ride share service where we need to uh, find a driver with a rider um, and using different um, uh, you know, cost of services, mapping is also that search experience. And again, you know, kind of back to the observability use case, uh, anomaly detection is search. Um, you know, you know, the days of, of you looking at through a knock and, and, and waiting for something to happen, obviously your time is better spent just to get alerts on different anomalous activities, either peaks or values in the data, or even when we're looking at uh, forecasting. And, you know, uh, the, the technology on the forefront, kind of on the frontier is this na uh, natural language processing is also a search experience. This is also search, being able to 
look at uh, and, and listen in to our devices and here, for example, um, you know, uh, we can listen and uh, take these language uh, processors and put it into text for us to analyze later. Um, so that's kind of search in, in a nutshell. I'm gonna go back to this uh, presentation here. So uh, search is uh, an elastic, you know, an elastic is a search company. And just to confirm, you can't see my uh, notes right on top, right? We cannot, no. Cool. Just, I don't want this big screen that's in the middle of it. <laughs> so really, I mean, search is, is foundational and it's, it's very omnipresent, uh, omni, omnipresent in everything that we're doing, whether searching through logs, metrics, we're looking through documents, uh, having our users going through um, e-commerce data, you know, through your, your webpage. Uh, it's in everything and, and everything that we do all day. And how we do that today is, is really through the, the stack, right? The Elastic stack, which is kind of comprised of Elasticsearch, Kibana, Beats, and Logstash. And during our demonstration today, we'll be using primarily Elasticsearch, just as, which is our RESTful distributed search engine, and interacting with uh, Logstash and Beats, uh, the ingest pipe line that provides data into Elasticsearch. And of course, Kibana, um, while we're uh, visualizing this data and looking through some of the data that we have. Of course, Kibana, which you'll see here in a little bit, is also used to, kind of, to monitor some of these index lifecycle management policies. So let's get right into it. Hopefully that wasn't too long uh, to go through some of the background history. Um, but yeah, let's talk about ILM. So I know before ILM, uh, there was something that was called Curator. And, and Josh and I were kind of talking about, you know, what, what the old days old days with Curator was. And I don't know, Josh, is there something you can, <laughs> you want to, uh, you want to add on, on Curator and maybe how it worked? Well, so yeah, what Curator would do is it was just a set of scripts that you would build um, policies in text files and then schedule those through cron to run. To run. So it would, uh, for hot warm architecture, it would move your indexes from your hot to, to your warm. Uh, if you wanted to merge your data, you could do a force merge to be able to uh, lessen the segments on the cluster or snapshot or delete. So it was really the introduction to ILM, just not centralized in the cluster. Um, yeah, and, and it was, um, it, yeah, it definitely was outside. It was an outside experience to, to mm -hmm. Elastic or, or you know, with the Yelk stack, right? It was yeah. something you had to run as a cron job or as an administrator you had to run. And there was kind of some, some different criteria that would pick up through, through um, Curator, you know, so if a document got to, or the amount of documents got to a certain point, you know, if the, if the documents aged a certain amount, then it would, it would do these actions. Uh, mm -hmm. Also be like maybe size on disk, right? So how mm -hmm. many, yeah. these three different actions kind of, you know, helped Curator, you know, these three decision makers would say, okay, this has been met, then I will do this action. Right. And a lot yeah. of that happened to be like deleting or uh, creating snapshots, you know, rolling the index over into another index. So, you know, um, it, was, it was very uh, apparent in the very beginning of Elasticsearch is, you know, what do I do with a lot of this data that I'm receiving? You know, if it's, you know, a time series based use case, you'll quickly find that your disk starts to fill up and it becomes very, you know, okay, what do I, what do I need to do with this data? You know, um, right. that's kind of where Curator was born from. Mm -hmm. And it also, I, the usage of it also kind of showed where its limitations were, especially as you started to grow your clusters, they started to get bigger. These jobs started to stack up, not, not able to finish before the, before the job. So it, I think that's why we kind of work towards another um, cluster-based policy for these to be able to put it inside the cluster. Yeah, and, and beginning in, I think it was like, uh, it was a beta in 6.6, .6, I believe. 6.6, 6, yeah. Yep. Yeah, and then it went in GA, the, uh, the 6.7 is, is where we brought in index lifecycle management into, uh, uh, into Elasticsearch. And really the, the, the purpose of this was really to um, help you manage your indices or really kind of like the life cycle management of your, of your data. Um, you know, so when data is first ingested, you know, being time series data, uh, it'd be ingested into what we call as, as a hot node. Um, and as that data, you know, continues to age, uh, it perhaps would be queried less, um, becomes a little less valuable because it's, um, you're not searching as often. Um, and you need to maybe move that data from that hot life cycle into warm. 
And having that data warm life cycle still lets you keep the data and search it. You know, let's say an event happens, uh, it span over a week's period of time, having some of that data on hot, let's say over a daily indice, rolling over into a weekly indice would still give you some visibility into that. And if you think about hot versus warm, hot architecture would be kind of your most costly instances or the most um, higher end CPU and memory and you know, SSDs or disks, because that's gonna be the most actively searched or even indexed. So a lot of the activity from a compute resource is, is very intense. But the search is, is not as prevalent as you kind of go down the, 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 the cycles. You know, warm, it's not gonna be as uh, searched as often. And thus, you don't, need, you don't need the horsepower or the performance really behind that node. And even kind of going into cold, cold might even be something where you want to keep maybe monthly indices or keep um, uh, data for regulatory reasons. You know, I have to keep this data on disk. And we'll kind of go into a little bit more on this, this phases. But really, ILM just gave you the uh, ability to automatically do uh, these, these uh, uh, roll over these policies over to them. Um, and really the, the purpose kind of this presentation is really to help you, uh, you know, prior to 7.10, because we're going to talk about maybe some of the, well, we are going to talk about some of the changes in life, uh, index lifecycle management with data tiers and also something called searchable snapshots, because that also has now improved this uh, experience even more so. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of go into a demo and walk through uh, basically um, how to set up ILM. And this is uh, based upon that you already have existing an existing cluster. I think it's really easy for you to stand up a brand new instance and then kind of start fresh. But a, a lot of the, the uh, a lot of the uh, things that we've seen that Josh and I've seen, and, and maybe Josh, you can kind of go into this a little more in depth, uh, specifically is around clusters that are already pre-existing. What are some mm -hmm. kind of issues and pitfalls that that you may have hit? because you're already kind of in production and rolling on. So um, is there anything that off the, off, off the top of your mind, Josh, that, that comes to mind on configuring your ILM? Well, uh, yeah, no, I think you handled it pretty well. But yeah, one of the th um, main points that I have uh, benefited from with ILM is before ILM, you, um, you had to attempt to calculate your ingest rate, the index sizes, all these different settings as best you could based on unknown ingestion, unknown um, logs. So you would try to set up your shard sizing based on really unknowns. So now with ILM, you can set the policy, your shard sizes are always very similar. So you don't have to go back, re-index or go back and create new shard strategy for your cluster. So that is one of the, uh, one of the large benefits of ILM as well. And that really helps uh, with, with the legacy data also because many of uh, the, the older clusters have used default strategies, which are um, tend to be over sharded and and not as performant as they could be. So ILM really helps out with the uh, with the shard strategies going forward. Perfect, yeah. And we um, before the demo, we also want to talk about just kind of the, the really basic architecture of what we're we doing today, and really the the purpose of having a very basic architecture is to really, you know, you could stand this up with, a, let's say you're a laptop or a container or something that you can test with your side. So you can practice and really try, try this out maybe before you, you actually go into production. So we really, um, you know, Josh with this demo, which I really appreciated, you know, him walking through the demo and us and kind of working together is, is kind of really how simple this um, process is. Um, and one thing that we'll do is uh, Josh did a great job of, you know, kind of creating a, uh, what, do you, what do you call it? Um, not a template, a guide, I think you mm -hmm. called it, kind of yeah. to walk you through these steps that we're doing today. So yeah. Um, yeah. maybe we can put that to GitHub or, you know, think mm -hmm. of a way to, to distribute it. So yeah, absolutely. But but basically, do you want to kind of go into how this, your architecture for, for this demonstration is kind of laid out? Yes, perfect. So um, we, need, uh, we needed some form of logs. So I'm using a, an application called F-Log or Flog. Uh, it really just stands for fake log. I have it um, set to create Apache common log files. It's writing those out to disk um, continuously until I tell it to stop. Uh, then I have the log stash instance running on my local laptop, which is monitoring that log file for changes. It is then uh, parsing it with the Apache common uh, grok pattern and then outputting it to my uh, cloud Elasticsearch instance. Uh, the cloud Elasticsearch instance has uh, the Elasticsearch as well as Kibana. And then 
so that is the first uh, the first demo, and then after that, um, it's it's not using ILM on the on the first set, and then I will stop it, implement ILM, and then we'll run through it again with the existing data and show you how it uh, how it just works together. And then I think you'll, um, and if you're interested in kind of what the configuration is and so forth, well, we'll uh, Josh will share a screen and we'll go through some yep. of those details as well. And then the next part of that, we'll, we'll just use it rather than using log stash and go direct uh, metric beat directly into Elasticsearch and kind of yeah. showcase the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And metric beat is much, uh, much more simple. It's, it's, it's built around ILM. So there's really um, a configuration option and then just rerunning the, uh, the configuration setup to the cluster. So it's much uh, much less detailed. So. Perfect. Okay. Excellent. Well, let, let me go ahead and stop sharing here. Okay. Uh, and then Josh, if, if you want to share your screen, Let's see um, if we can go through that demo. Okay. And again, if, if there's anyone that has any questions or anything that, that wants to ask, you know, feel free to hit, hit in chat and I'll, I'll try to um, kind of surface that up in the middle. There. Are you able to see my screen? Sure can. Is that hard okay. to for anyone to read, or uh, you know, should the screen resolution be changed, or is that is it okay for everyone? Good. Okay. Okay. Excellent. So as you see here, we have uh, my Kibana instance. This is running on the latest uh, seven point ten that we've recently released. Uh, let me move the uh, all the people here. There we go. So we will have I have uh, the Logstash data going in there. I wanted to have Logstash running so that we could kind of see a pre-existing cluster. Uh, it is reading the Apache log files uh, from, from the FLOG application. You can see here that we have the index uh, using just a typical daily index uh, for today's date. Uh, we have the pattern, the log stash dash asterisk pattern. So you can see it, it's updating. So that is the pre-existing log stash instance, just a typical ingestion from any Apache server. Um, let me run through here really quick to show you. We just have a single index, uh, the regular log stash template, no ILM policies, no additional settings. So it's just basic, nothing, nothing to it. I just started it and ran it. Let me take a look at the um, configuration file really quick. Hopefully you are able to see this. Um, not sure if I can ex uh, enlarge it at all. Um, does it look okay? Still good? Okay, so here again, we have the input blog is writing out to blog that out. I have my single grok pattern uh, for Apache Common, and then I have my output here. Uh, right now, you can see that we are use, uh, writing out to a daily log stash pattern. You'll notice that the ILM alias pattern and policy are all commented out, so they're not in use. I left those there just for viewability and just to see what the changes will be in the next one. So, and then here is the actual running process. So we can see that it is running. Um, what I'm going to do is I need to update. So the, the next steps are for ILM to work, you have to have a, an alias that points to a, a new uh, index that has a seed on the end of it. I'm using this pattern 00001. So I'm gonna create uh, an alias of logstash. It will send all rights to logstash-00001 until the policy is triggered, at which point it'll create the new uh, index of logstash-00002. In order to do that though, I need to have some settings in the template to be able to, so those settings are applied to each, each new uh, index. So let me, uh, grab that really quick and or actually first of all let me create the ILM policy sorry so in order to for ILM to work you have to have a policy saying uh, monitoring your indexes so we have through Kibana we have uh, let me uh, actually walk through that again so it's a little bit easier to view so we go down to management to stack management we have index lifecycle policies I don't have a, a policy for log stash yet so I'm going to create a policy called log stash. Here's where I set the policy actions. I'm going to set it for hundred megs just so we can actually see it in action today. Um, and then I'll set it to one day. So what this is saying 
is anytime that index reaches 100 megs, roll it over into the next index. I will say that it doesn't happen immediately at 100 megs. We have a timer inside of Elasticsearch that's monitoring. If the timer takes uh, 10 minutes default and you've hit it, the 100 megs just after that trigger ran, it could it could considerably grow, which is you'll see here because I have it set to one minute. And I and I grow faster, uh, pretty fast with the uh, with the local flog. So here we have a uh, the policy now. You can see the actions. Oh, sorry, you can see see the uh, data for it. We can see the uh, the JSON for it. So you could actually copy and paste this into the Dev Tools if you'd like. Okay, so now that we have the policy, now we need to update the index template. That way, each new index that's created uh, will be able to use this policy that we've just created. So let's go to index management. We will go to index templates. And since we have already been ingesting Logstash, we should have a index template there for, for, the te uh, for that index. We can go to index settings and instead of using our API, it's all now built into, into our index uh, management. So what this is saying is this is a new lifecycle setting. It's using the log stash policy and the rollover alias inside of Elasticsearch is log stash. We'll go ahead and go next, next, save template. So now any new index that's created with the log stash dash or that matches this, this pattern will have those settings in the index. Now, the next step is we will stop our current log stash ingestion. So I'm just gonna control C that. The uh, original config that I was running was the pre ILM that just, that was before any ILM settings. Let me show you what the current config is. <clears throat> Here it is. So we're still using the same log file, flog.out, same pattern. Now I've commented out the index. So it's no longer using a daily index. Now it's just using a ILM rollover alias, the number and the policy. And then we will go ahead and start the service. Go back to discover. Process is almost completed. There we go. So data is now coming in. We can go to this latest index. We see that it is now using the log stash, the, the new index that's uh, pointed to by the alias. So we are now using ILM, the alias is now uh, accepting data on Logstash, redirecting it to the current writer index, which is Logstash-00001. Okay, so how do I know that we're using that? So let's go back to DevTools. I have some commands here in DevTools. Um, I can, we can definitely share those with you in the guide. I'm going to just quickly show you a few, a uh, few different things. This Logstash ILM explained shows you the current steps that your index is in. We have it being managed as true. We have it currently roll over as true and check rollover ready. I'm sorry, action is roll over, check roll over ready. So as soon as it notices that the index has reached that action point of 100 megs, it will start the rollover action. It has been taking about two minutes for me to, to see that happen though. So. So in, in the meantime, while well, that's, that's uh, taking some time, you know, it looks mm -hmm. like you can build this policy directly through the API if you want, um, if you're Absolutely, more familiar yes. with that. So you can do like a Postman API or you can do, uh, you yeah. know, just through, you know, a curl command. I have it right, right here on the, on the screen, uh, if you're using DevTools. So here is the policy that, that we built using Kibana. So Perfect. you can definitely use an API. Yeah, or you know, if you're more comfortable within the the management for within Kibana, then you can create it that way. So there's there's some yep. flexibility on on how on how to, to to look at that. Yep, absolutely. So we're still in the check rollover ready. Like I said, it will take a, a little bit of time for that trigger to hit before it 
uh, finalize or finally kicks over to the next index. I did want to ask one quick question, um, huh? and it looks like I think we got a question here in chat, which I'll, I'll get to in a second here. Um, do you, uh, when when work, working with uh, users and, and customers with ILM, um, is there you know kind of a one thing that people that that folks get caught on um, in terms of this ILM configuration, something that kind of is a something that everyone should kind of be aware of? Um, I'm not sure that there's really the the biggest confusion. I think is really setting up the alias and how does the alias work, and will it work with my existing data? So as long as you have an index pattern that matches what you are going to be using with the ILM, it should still work with your existing data. So as long as they are, are still encompassing the same pattern, it should just all work together. Perfect. Okay. Um, so it looks like Mike has a question in here. Um, okay. If you want to. Uh, take a take a valent effort at. Um, so Mike asks, uh, what would happen if you had created a log stash policy, not applied it to the log stash template, um, but then had those uh, config still within the log stash uh, configuration file, log stash .conf file? So Curator doesn't really work with log stash. Curator actually works against the Elasticsearch cluster. Oh, my apologies. Maybe I, I misspoke here. Um, I, it, yeah, what would happen if you had created the log stash policy, not applied it to the uh, log stash template, but had added those configurations to the log stash.conf file, dot .conf file. Mm -hmm. So um, my thought on this is because if you create a, um, a log stash policy, but not applied it to the template, mm -hmm. um, then it's uh, your, those island policies are not going to be in place because it's going to still look for the island policy the, or the, the template you had before, which was the log stash dash zero, 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 one. So you had, if you hadn't uh, applied that to the template and that might be um, abbreviating it. I don't know if you want to go into more details on that. Um, actually, I'm not, I'm not certain if that's the case anymore. It might be that we have default settings now for ILM that if there is nothing set, it uses a default uh, policy to, to roll those over. So Honestly, okay. I would probably have to, uh, I'd have to uh, do some research on that to see if it, if it's still the case. Cause yeah, prior to, prior to more recent versions, it would not work. It would, uh, it would not, would not have that, um, those indexes and that, that template in place. So it would not be able to, to write there. Okay. But, uh, so yeah, Mike, we'll, 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 um, if you're, if you want to tag either myself or Faith and we can get back to you just on the specific answer mm -hmm. on that. So it looks like we are complete. So the 0001 is now complete. What I can do here is actually, no, let me go use the Kibana since I'm there. Go to stack management, go to index management. And now you see that we have a, a new index, 00002. So that means ILM has rolled that over. It's about to roll over the next one. You can see here, like I said, it, if you're ingesting quickly, your policy might not roll it over fast, fast enough to, uh, to be the right storage size, but I'm sorry, not the right storage size. It just might roll over later than what you're expecting. So now let's go to discover. We have our, you see, we have our little outage here when we uh, shut log stash off. If you have a queue or something in place, it should pick those up. Uh, right now I'm not, I don't have any queuing in place. And then you see here, our, our newest index is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.0002. So that's that's it for Logstash. Um, we had existing data, uh, implemented the ILM policy, added the settings for the index, and then uh, restarted the process using the, the template and the, uh, the alias. Awesome. Uh, do you want to walk through some of the uh, the metric beat uh, configs Absolutely. that you look at? Absolutely. So metric beat is much simpler. So I'll just preface that really quick. It's let me go ahead and close this. So with metric beat, since it uh, it's been it's had ILM bundled with it for. A, quite some time uh, people sometimes don't use it if they don't have, if they're not using ILM policies natively so that's how I was originally I did not have ILM built in so this is 
an, again, a reason that it's near and dear to my heart to figure this out. So let's take a look at the <clears throat> metric beat YAML file. Uh, really, all we are concerned with is that we have an ILM section here. You can go to setup ILM. We have either it's uh, enabled true or enabled false. Those are the only two settings that I'm changing right now. By default, every all these settings are commented out, but to make it easier for here, I have uh, uncommented the other settings because those can be uncommented even though ILM is false. So if you're not using ILM, if ILM is enabled to set to false, you can still leave these uncommented and it will work as, as normal daily indexes. Hopefully that makes sense. If, if not, I can kind of explain it a little bit better. So, but for this point, for my point here is we have ILM disabled. So we are going to run metric beat setup. Before I do that, let me go over here to Gabbana though, just to show you again, we don't have any, we have no metric beat indexes, no metric beat uh, policies. This says metrics, that is not metric beat policy. We don't have uh, metric beat index template or anything. So what the setup does is it takes all your settings from your config file, pushes those settings to your cluster uh, for you. You only run that when you need to make changes on the cluster. So you don't need to run that on every, every um, agent. So you would run it on the first agent. If you need to make changes in the cluster, again, you would run it on one agent instead of running it on all of them. And, and what's nice here too is with, with metric beat um, or just any of the beats that, that we have is that it, it preloads, and, and again, this is kind of a separate discussion, but I just felt this is very important to, to, to point out. If, if you haven't really used metric beat or at least the latest beats, it, it loads a lot of uh, pre-can dashboards that you can use right out of the box for it. Yes. So one thing that we're doing right now, it's loading the dashboards and will be loaded into Kibana. So as a side note, let, let's say after this demonstration, we can go directly right within the metrics um, mm -hmm. dashboard and you get a, a readout of, of what's going on on Josh's uh, machine there. You know, what's his what's memory or CPU? Let me see what maybe Zoom's doing to his machine. But yeah, uh, uh, but yeah that kind of, that's a nice thing that's included with uh, with Beats is just that pre-can dashboard. Absolutely, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. It's very useful. So you'll see here, it's it takes a few minutes to, to load. Okay, there we go. So we have it, have the uh, setup completed. Let me, uh, we now have, or we still don't have any of the uh, any of the policies because it's disabled. No indexes, so we can go ahead and metric beat dash e. So what this is doing, this is just starting the process. It looks for the metric beat YAML file, and e logs to standard out. So I will see any logs on my on my screen. There we go. We have the metric beat version seven six zero with today's date. Still no policy. One thing that the setup also does is it creates an index pattern for you. So if you, uh, with logs dash, we had to, on your first ingestion, you might not see it on discover until you create an index pattern inside of Kibana. With metric beat, part of the setup is it creates that uh, index pattern for you in the dropdown. So we have data here ingesting into the, into the elastic stack. We see our index here. It's just my typical typical uh, event information for my host. So with that, instead of just canceling the, uh, the service, I can actually let it continue to run and just update the, uh, the YAML file. And then as soon as, uh, it, as soon as I'm done with that, I can run the setup again. So, what I'm doing here is I'm going down to the ILM section, Oops, past it. I am now changing it from ILM enabled false to true. So now ILM is enabled um, in the configuration. Now we need to push those changes to the cluster so that it knows that ILM is enabled. So again, we will kill the service. We'll run the setup again. So this is going to take the configuration and overwrite all the all the changes that are in the in the cluster with these new set, uh, new settings. 
Yeah, and if <clears throat> if you're Grok illiterate like I am, or I at least fumble with with Grok a lot, um, this setup with uh, Metric Beat uh, becomes a lot uh, uh, becomes you know a, a lot easier um, mm -hmm. rather than you know, working with log stash so forth. I know one thing that we introduced in seven at nine also is the concept of the elastic agent. So what we're doing is we're pre-packaging all these different beats like packet beat, metric beat, file beat, wing log beat, um, you know, all these beats into one centralized agent, which really helps out, um, which you'll be able to manage directly through, through Kubana as well. Right. Um, yep. So that's, Absolutely. that's something that, you know, will help simplify rather than installing multiple beats. But... Yeah. So you see the part of the setup process is now complete. We now have a seed index, no documents going to it yet. Uh, you can click on it. You can see these settings here. It now has the uh, rollover alias as well as the policy name. Setup is complete. So we could go ahead and start it, but I wanted to show you uh, some of the other things that have been added. So we still have this old uh, index template from the previous, uh, previous in installation, but now we are using this new index template. Uh, using the new index, uh, metric B dash asterisk pattern, which still would uh, encapsulate the previous metric B dash 7.6.0, but now it is uh, shorter. So, and then it's using the metric beat policy. It has also created the metric beat policy. Unfortunately, we will not be able to see it roll over because by default, it just creates a, a 50 gig. Um, index size, 30 days. I could change it, but metric beat is so slow, we'd still be waiting here for quite a while for it to roll over. Yeah, it, it's good data that, that's been collected, but it's just very small amounts. <laughs> it is, yeah, extremely small amounts of data. So now so, I'm just going to run the uh, the process again, just as we had before. Did you have a question? Um, it, it did, but it's okay. Go ahead and, go ahead and continue. Okay, we can... okay. Yeah. So we are starting up the metric beat uh, agent. Looks like it's already started. We have data coming in already. We have an event and we are on the metric beat 0001 index seed. This is still your old data. You can go in and zoom into it and see that in the same timeline, you still see the old data. So it still works together and queries uh, to that uh, index pattern will still hit all the indices. And then that is, that's really all I have for this, uh, for this demonstration. Perfect. And we, we can go, uh, there's a question that was asked. Uh, we'll, we'll address it together, Josh. And then I'll go into maybe some of the 7.10. Oh, before we do that, um, uh, let, let's get this question um, addressed. And then we can go through just to show that metric beat um, dashboard. And then we'll go into the 7.10 and how a lot of this is, is kind of changed uh, again for 7.10 in the, in the better also. So, mm -hmm. um, so OP asks, um, if you have 20 metric beats and you want to enable ILM for all of them, um, do we need to run set command only on one and still uh, set ILM to true for the YAML file for all 20? Is that correct? Correct. That is correct. So yeah, you would go in and set the configuration for all of them to that uh, enabled true and then have all the other uh, other settings also uncommented that you, that you need uh, for the policy, for the rollover alias, all those would be uncommented also, similar to how I had. But you only want to run the setup on one, on, the, on your first agent. That way it pushes those changes to the cluster just once. Yeah, so, um, and you might be able to, there's a couple of ways that you could probably, um, uh, you know, some automation on the agent side, uh, you know, um, salts, chef, puppet, exactly. Yeah, um, yeah. you know, where um, I, I do want to, one thing though, that's, that's related here. Um, can you go to um, within Kibana, uh, Let's. can you go to, um, let's see here. Uh, uh, yeah, the dashboard, let's go to the dashboard. I do want to show you though, for the agents, it, you know, uh, being able to do a fleet and change the uh, and register an agent. I know that's not really a part of this, uh, you know, meetup de demonstration. That's something we can show you um, and, and just right after this. Um, so then, then you know, in the future, if you deploy this as an agent, which is which is beta now, that you won't have to go through every single um, <clears throat> metric beat YAML file and make that configuration. You can actually do it from here within the Kibana UI. So, mm -hmm. but let's do this. Let's go into the um, 
the metric beat. Actually, if you, um, Josh, if you go, I think it's just under metrics. If you go to the very top, oh. <clears throat> oh, you can find it here as well. Like the, um, you said metrics. Uh, actually, I think if you go to the three um, prong. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. And then right under observability, you can go right to the metrics uh, right there. Oh, metrics. There we go. Yeah. And then this should, um, yeah, here we go. And this just kind of shows you that this is, this is Joshua's or Josh's like to call him, um, uh, his metric, uh, or, uh, automatic dashboard that was created for that. And if we can go like, for example, into the metrics explorer, um, right next to inventory. Yeah. And then it'll, you know, give an idea of, of, um, the different charts that are going on. So it should load more information on CPU memory and so forth. We'll see what, what we kind of what we load up here now with the inventory if you're running a larger cluster like uh, kubernetes or, or or many hosts it's going to show you all of your hosts in little squares just like that so it gives you an overview of of your complete cluster so it's yeah. really good for a fast glimpse into your environment looks like i made this cluster underpowered <laughs> well it's for a demo and I kind of sprung this up on the, on the last minute for you. I uh, <laughs> wonder if I need to get rid of those. There we go. Yeah, because I was looking for Docker and Kubernetes oh, okay. for some reason. Yeah. So we have just my system CPU here. Yeah, and you could probably go back to, to uh, yeah. yeah, look at CPU count and so forth. But that's the nice thing is, is it builds some of these um, dashboards for you to start playing with right away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, the time to... Kind of get started and exploring, you know, definitely that, that process is shorted a lot. Yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to show, it kind of related to OP, your question, is kind of going through the, the agent. Um, and because this is, you know, 7.9, it might just take me a minute to, to find where this is in the Kubana. But yeah, if you go under here, and I think it's just under, um, I think we just want to ingest data. So maybe if we go like home. So this is 7.10 that I'm using. Oh yeah, so they might have changed. Uh, oh yeah, so under add elastic agent. So it's like in the middle of the screen uh, down below, yeah. So again, this is in beta, so it's not uh, currently in GA. So um, might be you know something for you kind of experiment with right now. Uh, if you have an environment or you wanna stand up, let's say a free trial on Elastic Cloud, like a 14 day free trial, then kind of play around with it. But what you can do is um, once you have the agent, you know, this will actually walk you through the process of installing the agent, which may have, for example, uh, 20 metric feet and, you know, you can add those agents in. And then uh, when you actually uh, uh, enroll that, then you can actually make those changes directly from here rather than going directly onto every system that you have metric feet right. installed on. So for okay. example, if you go right over to integrations, it'll talk about the different integrations that you can you can select. Um, and again, this is just um, some of the uh, um, integrations that we have. That's just kind of popular, but you know, for a full list of what beats and what agents are a part of, um, you know, you can go onto the community site, uh, community created or Elastic uh, officially supported. So anyway, hopefully that kind of answers your question right now. Like if in 7.9, you know, if you're looking at this metric beat and you'll have to do that with some, you know, orchestration on changing everything. Um, and then you want to run the configuration once against Elasticsearch, you know, the setup. Um, and then 7.10, if you want to play with the beta pieces, then you can kind of configure it for the Kubana UI and look for agent to be GA to be able to do a lot of this just from the UI rather than going to 20 and, and changing that, that con file, or the YAML yeah. file, excuse me. Excellent. So. Awesome. Uh, so before we kind of go into the 7.10 pieces, is there any questions, anything else that, that we want to... Um... Yeah, I think OP was looking for like the, uh, the uh, data fleet change. Yeah, we'll, we'll um, you know, maybe for the next, another meetup that we want to kind of go around on the same type of ILM, you know, we'll, we'll do that. Um, only reason why we can't do that right now is you, um, Josh would have to install the agent and configure it mm -hmm. and then integrate that. And we just did the, uh, the standalone metric beat for that. So, yeah. but for the next, uh, meetup, we'll, we'll definitely do something like that. Perfect. Um, any other questions 
And then if not, we'll, we'll, we'll jump right into the uh, presentation here again, and then kind of go over the 7.10 announcements that really um, uh, impact ILM. I'll go ahead and stop sharing. Cool. All right. Well, let me go ahead. And, and if you have any questions and you're still typing it, don't worry, we'll, we'll come back to it. So, so we'll come here and we go ahead and uh, present here. Just making sure that you're not seeing my ugly notes right in the middle. Good. <laughs> okay, good. All right. So 7.10 was released in on November 10th uh, or maybe no, maybe it was November 11th. Excuse me. Yeah, it was, it was um, November 11th, 11, 11. And um Basically, with uh, the announcement for that, we're introducing something that's called uh, data tiers. And if you think about this kind of lifecycle management going from hot, being that's very expensive, um, to warm, which is you know a little slower user, or excuse me, a lower search experience um, for read-only data. Um, but of course, um, you know it's a lot more uh, cost efficient to do that. But with data tiers and searchable snapshots, you'll be able to store and save a lot more. Um, and I'll kind of go into, you know, why that's being claimed right now. You know, when I ask a lot of people that are kind of using um, data tiers, uh, or excuse me, uh, when I, I talk to users uh, within the community, <clears throat> how much data do you need? Uh, how much, uh, you know, what's kind of the regulatory needs? So a lot of customers say, oh yeah, I need, you know, one month worth of data to be hot. I need to search it. And and then I need, you know, for regulatory reasons, I need to keep the data needs zero uh, a year or two years. Uh, but for a lot of people that I ask, um, it's still an unknown. Like, you know, I'm not really sure. I mean, maybe regulatory, yeah, we got to keep this data maybe as a snapshot or something else. Uh, it's important, uh, but it's not something where, you know, when when do you need an answer if, let's say, lawyers start knocking at the door, uh, or when you're doing, let's say, a security audit, um, looking for a longer breach. How, how fast to get those results can really impact the, the, the depth of the breach and or um, really, you know, in, into investigations of, of what's going on. So keeping data and, and having data is kind of ambiguous to a lot of people. It's, it's really, it depends on, on your use case, but having a lot more data, I think uh, can kind of open up a lot more use cases here. And so Josh, uh, Kind of walked us through what it looks like, you know, prior to um, 7.10, just the 7.9, and I re really like the simplicity of how Josh made this the the configuration and the demo. So it's something that you know we'll publish the the slides or excuse me the the guide that walks you through this, so you can kind of practice on your own before you before you go into production. But yeah, let's just quickly cover what we've done with data tiers as a whole in in 7.10. So of course we've had support for these unofficial data tiers like the hot and warm uh, for for quite some time. And what Josh just went through for the index lifecycle management really provides conventions to make it easy to manage uh, data across, you know, these different phases um, of, of data, you know, through, through hot and warm nodes where, you know, really, again, hot is generally the, where your fast machines, your fastest SSDs, uh, more CPU, more RAM, the instance type, let's say is, is a lot more expensive. Um, and as it moves on to lower cost machines with like spinning disks or, um, you know, less CPU, uh, less memory, right? So there's some manual work, which I think, you know, Josh was able to do, even though, you know, even before 7.9, 7.8, 7.7, 7, you know, even before 6.6, there's a lot more of a manual process with that. Um, you know, setting up the attributes and referencing them appropriately with the island phases. Well, in 7.10, we've made it a lot easier by introducing a new row, a, a specific row, uh, node role, sorry, a new node role that can assign nodes to either hot, warm, or cold. Um, and then, of course, later on, there's another different node types that we'll be introducing. So now with ILM phases are automatically allocated data to the nodes with the matching roles. So that makes the job of admin uh, users a lot easier. And it really formalizes the whole data tier definition and associates the flow of the data from uh, you know, the temperature gradient, right? Based on your ILM policy, data will be kept on your hot tier for say it's seven days uh, before moving to the warm tier, which is kept on for 30 days and so forth. 
So rather than, as you saw Josh kind of configuring on these ILM policies, this is something that's done automatically for you. If you set up the node attribute, um, you know, hot, warm, or cold, it will actually do this for you. Now, the good news is, um, you know, you can obviously modify and change it. So we kind of have our best practices of what things you should use in terms of hot and warm. But, uh, but again, you know, we, we clearly recognize that, you know, some of what we've seen in the, in the field uh, might not be applicable, you know, to you or your use case. So you can definitely change those policies. Or you say, hey, you know, it just came out in 7.10. It's in beta now. Um, maybe for in GA, um, you know, I'll wait for that. You can always opt out. So you can still do this process that Josh just showed on the ILM policies. So really the hot warm tiers are, are kind of already there. And now we're really thrilled to, to announce kind of this newer low cost storage option in 7.10. And it's called the cold tier. And the natural progression is really from this hot and warm, right? Whether by age or different criteria, the different kinds of data have different levels that need to be searched and by frequency or con concern, uh, concurrency or speed and volume and, and so on, right? So the data is uh, accessed less frequently and has become read, uh, read only and can easily migrate between the cold tier. Um, but we're also reducing the, the storage footprint and potential up to costs up to 50%. And I'll kind of show you how we're, we're able to do that. Um, and that's in comparison to the warm tier. So by offloading the replica shard uh, data as snapshots and using, let's say, object storage by S3 is something that you can uh, utilize and, and use to really reduce that, that storage pieces. Um, and that's kind of where this other concept, which I'll be talking about um, shortly, where searchable snapshots really comes in. We're using automatically retrieved data from replica shards when, let's say, a primary shard fails. So if we look at like this hot warm architecture today, and if you're familiar with how Elasticsearch uh, utilizes um, primary and replica shards, whereas your primary shards are, are data that's, you know, essentially, you know, spread across these shards, these containers holding data. Um, and I say containers, not like the containerization, <laughs> but into these spaces where the, that's basically striped over, right? And we have the concept of these replica shards and replica shards are just copies of this data in case, you know, for resiliency. And it gives us a, a little larger uh, storage footprint or excuse me, searching footprint because you can only, you can always search uh, not only over primary or uh, but you can also search over replica shards. So, um, and uh, that's kind of how this is all la uh, layered out, let's see, in an in a SSD or, or any type of disk, right? Well, in the cold tier, uh, what we've done is, is separating the replica shards from the primary counterparts. So your primary shards are still running on local disk, let's say as your warm tier, um, but the replicas are now stored in snapshots such as like S3 or similar objects. Um, so we've now reduced the amount of storage needed on local storage could be those SSDs and then still keeping resiliency um, uh, to an S3 storage you know so we're reducing 50% of the storage on let's say those that warm uh, that warm tier the SSD -er, while keeping the replicas on an object storage so that's kind of where we see the reduction in cost and storage because S3 is traditionally um, well it is cheaper right um, uh, a lot cheaper and then also um, you know, we're reducing the amount of uh, the amount of uh, primaries and replicas that are required on, let's say, on local storage. So we're reducing that by half, and this is without an impact to resiliency, um, which is which is also amazing. And also, um, you can see because we are shifting some of those primary or replica shards away from that, it does um, it does slightly impact. Uh, performance in terms of uh, search performance. But if you think about the cold tier, you know, the, the, what we're looking at, this is like the regulatory data. This is the data you might be keeping uh, months, years, or two years, or, you know, or so on, right? And this is the data that um, is, is searched less frequently. So this might be the data that is not really necessarily important for you to get a fast result. And we're building a lot of these uh, search experiences like async search, getting results, um, uh, when when uh, you're querying as it's coming in rather than just a final, okay, now I've done my search query and then I'm going to return my results. So async search really will help out with this uh, user experience. So we also made some deep investments that uh, within the Lucene Elasticsearch side that really begins the search uh, for the shards in seconds along the primary shards. 
um, long before it, it would take you to restore this data from snapshot per se, you know, if you're keeping this data in snapshot and then kind of rehydrate that data into Elasticsearch and then search. So there's a lot of different advantages of that. So uh, one of the advantages of kind of, of keeping that data onto a, a snapshot or keeping that data into a, a, an S3 is this uh, concept of searchable snapshots. Now um, at meetups, what I like to do is really talk about the things, the data tiers, ILM, all that uh, those pieces are at the basic uh, licensing tier. So the basic is it's, uh, you know, it's open, it's, you know, for free. So it's something that uh, it's not part of our OSS, but it's a part of our, our basic licensing. So you can use it and consume it for free. Um, now the searchable snapshots, a part of this just kind of as a cautionary um, paid piece to this is, is within the enterprise licensing. Um, and I want to make sure I cover this because I think the power of the searchable snapshots in conjunction with cold really complements each other very well. So, you know, we had support for a lot of different snapshots for a long time. And, you know, while, you know, snapshot uh, lifecycle management is not really part of this meetup, but it's a great way to kind of back up your data into like an S3 or, or low cost object storage, you know, anything S3 complaint device. So you're successfully managing large volumes of data that's continuously being adjusted into your clusters and not having to break uh, a lot of different bank accounts because you can keep it on this low, uh, low cost storage. So if you need to retain your data for longer, for you know, for the long haul, without having to store um, this at, at a very high expensive, high SSD performance hardware, um, where you know your most frequent access data is needed and to be located, so you could further meet those regulatory and compliance requirements for data retention this way. So whether it's like two years or ten years down the road, or, or really something in between, you know, the issue to date is, however, um, how can you take these snapshots that aren't searchable? And you have to restore it into the cluster, um, into your, hard, uh, your high cost instances uh, before it can be accessed. And that's that rehydration we're talking about. And that really affects not only you, know, you as an administrator, but the user of the experience and really the time to value. So one of the things that we're talking about in 7.10, again, this is kind of the enterprise license, is we're introducing searchable snapshots. So this is an exciting new capability that literally brings the object storage to, to life. So your snapshots can now be directly queried and can come as an active part of your searches. And that opens up like a, a, you know, a whole slew of, of new opportunities and different use cases. So whether looking at historical data for audits or security investigations, or maybe um, performance comparisons year over year, uh, you know, searchable snapshots is, gives you the ability to search those, those uh, uh, snapshots directly. Um, and, and of course that could be on lower cost data and uh, adding that to the elastic stack really help um, a lot of people um, more effect uh, effectively balance performance, cost and data retention needs. And like a lot of features that, that we build, um, there's APIs that are directly in uh, control, how these searchable snapshots load, manage and, and search this data. So those are kind of the two big announcements that we made in 710. So the, the cold tier is, is announced as beta and that's a part of that basic. And then being able to uh, search these snapshots on different storage tiers like S3, for example, um, is also in beta. And that was announced um, in 7.10 as, as beta. And it's under the enterprise licensing agreement. Of course, that would just be you know, an agreement like a, a, a contractual money agreement, just to be very transparent with uh, everyone here. So really, if we kind of stand back and kind of look at what the things that we talked about today, um, with Josh and myself is, you know, we have data, you know, uh, either be from Logstash or Beats on the left-hand side. You know, we're kind of bringing this data into a hot tier. And then uh, Josh walked us through on how to uh, roll that data over using ILM into a warm tier. And then you can have that ILM, ILM, ILM policy, either delete that data or create a snapshot or whatever. And then with data tiers, now we're introducing, hey, now we can reduce that storage footprint and keep that data and transition it to cold. And then with searchable snapshots, you're able to quickly search. That's the benefit of having cold and having that fast search experience on cold is using uh, searchable snapshots to be able to quickly search that, that data onto cold and get that, that, uh, that data uh, relatively quick on that, that hardware profile. And as we go on, um, you know, there's gonna be a future different uh, tiers um, that, that we're gonna be talking about. So with that, uh, I think, that wraps it up. Um, 
I know we're a little bit over on time. Hopefully that's okay with everyone. Um, was there any, I don't know, Josh, if you were looking at quite, uh, any Q and A or any um, messages, was there anything in the, uh, in the yeah, chat I that I didn't see any other, didn't see any other questions. Perfect. And I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, look, it looks like I did get two things here. I'm gonna hit stop sharing for just a second. Perfect. And I think Josh, maybe you, you put, uh, oh, you, you just mentioned about the island policy, is there? Perfect. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah. Well, perfect. I think, um, I think that's it. <laughs> Josh, do you want to add anything to, to what was, what was said? No, I think it was good. Uh, one thing I will note, uh, will mention though, uh, on your closing, you had mentioned that I walked them through going hot warm. We actually did oh. not implement a uh, hot warm on this one just to, just to bring that up, it was just roll over on hot. Uh, warm is a little bit more uh, involved, but not not much more difficult. I just wanted to. Yeah, no. And as soon as you said that, yes, you only did hot. <laughs> but I think the simplistic of setting the hot and to rolling that over, I, I think is perfect. Um, just yeah. the very simplistic side of it, so you can kind of get started. Um, and maybe that's yes, something we can add as yeah, a, for the as next, a secondary. next one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you for letting well, me do this. And